before we pray, I'd like to have a little conversation, if you will. Who can tell me what they know about zombies? <laughs> They're ugly. They're ugly. They walk stiff. They walk stiff. They eat brains. They eat brains. They eat brains. Miranda, what do you know about zombies? You shot the head. You shot the head. <laughs> what did you say? Living dead. What did you say? They're disgusting. They're disgusting. They know that There's a really interesting, although not necessarily factual, sociological study that says that in, we're in the middle of you know, debate season right now. We just had a Democratic debate last night. We have Republican debates the past couple of weeks. Um, there's a really interesting sociological study that says that during Republican presidential seasons, when Republicans are in office, there are an influx of zombie meetings. <laughs> and then during Democratic presidential reigns, that there is an influx of vampire films. Now, there's less evidence to prove the vampire bit, but strong evidence to support zombies. If we look specifically at Reagan's presidency, the number of zombie films that were put out in the mid-80s is huge. Um, now, I don't know exactly what that says about Republicans or Democrats being compared to zombies and vampires. vampires. It may say something. But, uh, but it's there, and I find it incredibly interesting. Um, there, you, it's very easy to find online, and there's actually um, a, a really detailed critique of it, saying some of this is complete bunk, but the piece on zombies, there's definitely something to it. Would you pray with me? God. So unworthy. Really, we all are so unworthy. And sometimes we feel that heavy on our hearts. We let it get to us. We, but we know that you love us. You guide us. You direct our ways and our paths. That you are the thing that makes us rise in the morning. That allows us to go to bed peacefully. God, we ask that the Holy Spirit reign in this place, that the Spirit rain down on us, your children. That you may give us a message from you today. That my words may be your words. That you may open our hearts and open our minds to hear your message. Not my message, but yours. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together in this place of worship. <coughs> Let us together be better because of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Matthew 22, verses 23 through 33. The same day, some Sadducees came to him, saying, There is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teach it. Moses said, If a man dies childless, his brother shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died childless, leaving the widow to his brother. The second did the same, so also the third, down to the seventh. The last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them had married her. Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astounded at his teaching. This is the word of God for you and for many of the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Who here has a tendency to push the envelope? 
Who likes to see just how far you can run with something? See just how far you can take something before you get caught. Mm. We do it all the time. Apparently Maggie does it more than the rest of us. She's the only one willing to admit it. <laughs> Little white lies. Exaggerations of the truth. Sometimes these half-truths and bent realities become such a part of who we are, we forget that they were initially exaggerations. When the speed limit says 25 miles per hour, who among us drives 30? 35. 40. Does that change? Does that change when we look at highway speeds? Does 55 turn into 70? 75? Or 80 even? You try driving on the beltway and tell me just how quickly you might get run over traveling at the speed limit. Yeah. Of course, that is when the beltway is actually moving. <laughs> I remember last Christmas, Whitney and I were headed up to Marriott'sville for Christmas dinner. The roads were surprisingly busy, and everyone was driving a good 20 to 30 miles per hour over the speed limit. Right in the middle of this pack of cars, driving along the beltway, was a police officer. Now, every once in a while, you'd see the lights of the squad car flash. I think the officer was using their lights to manage the flow of traffic, but also to remind everyone that what consequences were in order should anyone decide to fall further outside the boundaries of egregiously violating traffic laws. This desire to live on the edge, to provoke authority, <laughs> to obey the laws that teeter on the boundary between obedience and adventurous negligence, extends to the way we interact with other people as well. Have you ever known anyone who was really good at reading people? You know, like a con artist, or a psychologist, a pastor, or a bartender? Such skills can be used for good or bad. And sometimes when people have a lot of interpersonal intelligence, they can use their powers of manipulation to trip somebody up in order to trick them into saying or doing something they might not have otherwise done that violates their character, their moral compass, or their understanding of life. That's what the Pharisees were doing when they asked Jesus whether or not it was right to pay taxes to Caesar. As Jeff taught us last week, not all laws set by humankind are just or necessarily moral. The reading for today immediately follows the controversy with the Pharisees that we discussed last week. The Pharisees laid out plans to trap Jesus in his words and failed to do so. Now, I don't know why the Sadducees chose this moment to also test Jesus, but they did. Perhaps they thought their chances were better since Jesus was already on the defensive. At any rate, the Sadducees came to Jesus the same day. In my studies, one of the commentaries said that this was a Tuesday. I don't know if that helps you, but it might. So, later that Tuesday, Jesus was confronted by the Sadducees. You have to understand, the Pharisees who came before were the spiritual fathers of Judaism. Our friend Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, had been a Pharisee. These people were known to be very accurate in their interpretation of Israel's laws, and they had a very legalistic outlook in general. The Sadducees, best known as was already mentioned for their reservations about resurrection, were primarily members of the aristocracy who comprised the priestly group which controlled the temple. In other words, they represented the Jewish ruling class. In essence, the question posed to Jesus is a riddle designed to trick him so that he will either condone polygamy or belie the afterlife. Let's take a look at the riddle and break it down. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies childless, his brother shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. We're going to stop right there. Sadducees were experts in the Pentateuch, or the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The rest of the Hebrew scriptures, the rest of the Old Testament as we understand it, hold very, held very little significance for them. Now... The law that they are referencing comes from Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. It's called the Law of Leverite Marriage. This term itself, Leverite, means brother-in-law. Leverite marriage states that a childless widow should be married to her husband's brother in order to bear a child who will carry the dead husband's name. 
In other words, the purpose of this law was to ensure that the name of the first husband would not be blotted out in Israel, to carry forth the family line. The riddle continues. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died childless, leaving the widow to his brother. The second did the same, so also the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them had married her. Like any good riddle, this riddle is rife with cheeky language. Unfortunately, the pun that's used here works a lot better in Greek than it does in English. While talking about Leverite marriage, the term Anastasi is translated raise up, as in to raise up children for his brother. In this latter passage, the same word Anastasi is translated resurrection. Their argument is based primarily on the lack of evidence that they could find for resurrection within the books of Moses. Likewise, they held a belief that God did not provide post-mortem punishment or reward. For the Sadducees, there was no heaven. There was no hell. There was no judgment. You died, and that was it. So the question, whose wife will she be, is actually a bit more pointed than it may sound to our ears. While the question could be interpreted as a matter of property rights, because women were, sadly, on par with property in the first century, the nature of the question is a bit more pointed than that, a little more audacious, if you will. The Sadducees were effectively asking, which one of us will legally be allowed to have sex with our wife in the New Age after the resurrection? Because after all, there is no resurrection. To which Jesus said, no. Just, no. You have no idea what you're talking about. Have you even read the scriptures? Because it's clear you don't know what they say. And another thing, the power of God escapes the limitations of your jaded thoughts and opinions. Now, I might be putting words into Jesus' mouth, so forgive me. But Jesus goes on to further offend the Sadducees by telling them the afterlife will be less like life here on earth. And more like the angels living now. And Sure, that may be a difficult blow for people who, much like their understanding of the resurrection, also didn't believe in angels. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astounded at his teaching. In an attempt to prove the Sadducees wrong by using the writings of Moses against them, Jesus reminds us of what the Hebrew scriptures say over and over again. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I am. We have heard these words before. I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. I am, the, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, Moses. I am has sent me to you. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The great I am. The Alpha and Omega. Beginning. And, and this is the one through whom Israel continues to live. God's I am implies that the covenantal relationship which was established with the patriarchs did not end when they died, but continues to live on in perpetuity until such a time as they are resurrected from the dead. For God is not God of the dead, but God of the living. Why then, brothers and sisters, are many of us ever so willing to live like zombies? Those of us who have been baptized were buried with Christ through the waters of baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. We are called to live like people who have been born again. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come, and yet we continue to live like zombies. There are people among us who claim to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. There are people among us who have been down the Roman road to salvation. But I am here today to tell you that we are not chickens who have simply crossed the road in order to get to the other side. Being a Christian is not about having your ticket punched, stamped, to ensure that when your time comes, you will be going to heaven. We as the people of God cannot continue to live like zombies. As long as there are people dying because of the color of their skin, 
as long as people are written off because of where they were born or where they were raised, as long as assumptions are made that one's religion, one's attire, automatically makes them a terrorist, as long as people of color are deemed to be exotic, as long as people exclude others based on physical features alone, as long as we continue to perpetuate binaries in a world made up of intercultural, interracial, interwoven stories, we as the church cannot afford to live like zombies. Amen. Injustice in this world is not limited to racism, systemic or otherwise. Poverty, as many of you know all too well, is a plague of modern society. Even for those who manage to obtain jobs and hold down those jobs, the minimum wage in this country, especially where we live, hardly reflects a living wage. Heaven forbid you're a woman, because that just means you're limited even further by a glass ceiling in a good old boys club. Try as we might your rising hope to provide hot meals to those who are hungry, what we do has its limits. The food that is wasted by corporations because of ludicrous rules and regulations, as well as the food that consumers throw away due to negligence and poor planning, could be used to feed the hungry. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that the hungry deserve scraps, that the hungry deserve waste. I'm saying that we could do things differently. We as consumers could shop more effectively. As voters, we could encourage our representatives to change the laws regarding distribution of food, which is being thrown out when it's still perfectly edible. There are children in this world who need to be loved, cared for, held. A friend of mine who recently graduated from seminary is serving a local church as a pastor and will be taking on her first foster child very soon. The foster care system is always looking for potential parents to foster, to adopt. If, I understand that may be too much commitment for many people, but kids can always use mentors. Widows, the elderly, like it when people visit them, take them out shopping for groceries or clothes. Sometimes in life, it's just nice to have someone to talk to. I could go on, and on, and on. Addiction, abuse, human trafficking, gangs, wars, terror. As troubling as it is, this list never ends. And we as Christians are called to action. The Bible says, what good is it, my brothers, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is death. We cannot continue to call ourselves Christians if all we want to do is sit on the sidelines and bide our time. We must refuse to live like zombies. God is not God of the dead, but of the living. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.